Of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we, we see the Apostle Paul writing about love and, and, and what love is. And he goes through this list and he, and he ends this list with this great statement that love never fails. That idea comes, um, comes from this word that, that means that it, it never ends. It never falls to the ground. It is literally endless. And so when we talk about the love of God, here's what you can know, that there will never be a time during, during human history, during all of eternity, there will never be a time when the love of God will be anything other than what it is. It will never end. It is as eternal as God himself. His love never fails. And therefore, we can take a lot of comfort from that truth. That God's love is just as true and enduring as God is himself. Which is, which is why Paul, again, at the end of this passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 13, he says, uh, he says this, Now, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so now, this week and the next couple weeks, we're going to be talking about those three things and the impact that they have on our life and the reality that they have in our life because of the cross, because of what Jesus did for us that we celebrated last week. Because of the resurrection, we can know these things for certain. And so um, we know that uh, we, can, we can experience these in this life, faith, hope, and love that ought to be our greatest um, ambition, our greatest aim in life to experience these things to the full. This is the stuff that matters. This is the stuff that lasts and that our life ought to be about. Faith, hope, and love. And uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this book, and this is really isn't a sermon on 1 Corinthians, but I think it's important for us to take a look at this. Paul's writing to this church in Corinth, this, this first letter of his, and it's, um, it, it, it's got a tone. If you've ever read 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians has a tone, and it's not a happy tone. It's kind of it's, it's a very unhappy tone, actually. He's, uh, Paul is, is writing. And so if you can think of like the, maybe a time in your life that a parent, like your mom or your dad, was ever really like super disappointed in you and just giving you a talking to, whatever tone that was is the tone that you probably should read 1 Corinthians in. Right? It is an unhappy tone. This church has gone haywire. They've gone off the tracks. They're, they're focused on all the wrong things. They've, they've embraced sin like crazy. Um, I, uh, I think this is, I mean, we could rename this book. Um, uh, if, uh, I think we could re rename this book First Americans. And, and we would probably be right on target. When we, when we talk about, and, and, and Craig talked about it this morning, I mean, the, the direction that the church has, has taken in so, many, in so many ways, we've just abandoned the, the, the scriptures and abandoned the foundation of, the, of doctrine that we have been given by God. And, um, and so these, these words that come to us um, through 1 Corinthians are so apt for us today. They've, been, they've become so focused on everything but the right thing, everything but the main thing. And Paul brings them back to this center place, this central idea of, of love, that this is what it's all about. This is the most important thing to focus your life on. This is where you live. And, and he says, you can, you can focus on all this other stuff, but listen, it doesn't matter. It's all about love. And he says... Um, this, this is what is worthy of your attention. And, he's, and so then he says, faith, hope, and love. These remain. This is, this is eternal stuff. This is meaningful stuff. This is, this is what we ought to focus our life on. And the greatest of these is love. He writes, he writes to um, young Timothy in, in his first letter, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5, and he says, he says these words as, in, as encouragement to him. He says, the aim of our charge is love, 
that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This morning I want to talk about faith. Faith, trust is another word that we might use for that, confidence. Well, sometimes when we talk about faith, it's just some kind of this weird ethereal word that what, is that, what does it even mean? But if I say the word trust, maybe we understand that better. Trust is something that is, is earned, but is also easily lost or broken when there is faithlessness. Maybe you've experienced that in your life. We've, we've put our trust in a great many things, and, and a lot of them we don't even think about. This, this weekend, I changed the oil in my car. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those necessary things to do. Where's Mr. Chanel? Is he here today? Did, he's, he's not here today. He would have been so proud, wouldn't he? Um, uh, we put... Uh, the, it's, it's one of those things we need to do. I, 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 I set my car up, and I have, a pair of, um, I have a pair of ramps, little black metal ramps, and I drive my car up on top of these ramps. And so I, I haven't changed the oil in this car very many times, um, and um, the car that I had before, I have, a, I have a forerunner, and it just, it looks bigger, it looks heavier than um, the other car I had, and I roll it up on the ramps, and I was looking at it, and it sure makes those ramps look really small. I just, and I had this thought before um, I got under the car, I just kind of looked at the ramps, I kind of looked at them twice. You know, this side and that side. And I just thought, they sure do look small. Those ramps look small. But they held. They held like they, they always have before. And, and uh, I hope that they always will, uh, of course. We put our faith in things like that. And, and though I had a moment of doubt, I still got down on the ground and got under the car and did the work that needed to be done. There was faith there. Um, Sometimes we we put our faith in our car, right? We 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 usually don't even think about this. Um, Usually, maybe you do, uh, depending on the the condition of your car at this moment. You might uh, get up tomorrow morning and um, be ready to go to work, and you uh, get in your car without even thinking about it, and trust it to get you from point A to point B. Just have some confidence. This car will work. Maybe you have one of those cars that where you don't. You just, you're just like praying the whole time, right? That, that it'll keep going, but uh, you do your best. We, we put a lot of confidence in other drivers. We, we drive all the time. We put a lot of confidence in other drivers, especially I think about it sometimes when I'm, you know, on, the, on, on a highway going really fast and passing people within a few feet. I think, boy, we sure put a lot of confidence in each other when we're driving. You know, there's this, there is just this trust that you, you know, you do your job, I'll do mine. All right? That's, that's kind of how we, that's kind of how we roll there. We trust one another. I got up on a ladder yesterday. Um, and I was thinking about the same thing. I was going to get up on a ladder Friday, and, uh, but do you remember the wind on Friday? Yeah. I lost faith <laughs> completely. I didn't want to do it. Uh, it wasn't because um, I thought the ladder wasn't strong enough. I just didn't think I'd wait enough, actually, uh, to, to stay on the roof in all that wind. I didn't want to... Uh, I didn't want to experience flight in that way. So I, I gave up. I waited a day, and then I went up on a roof, on, got on a ladder, and I trusted the ladder, and they're, you know, getting on and off and, and all those things. It's not, it uh, shouldn't be taken for granted. We should be careful, but there's trust. Dude, every time you get in an elevator, you are making a statement of faith. Um, and I'm, uh, I, uh, I, I didn't used to be like this, but I'm really glad that elevators are made out of steel because you can't see through steel. When I was a kid, I remember getting on elevators that were uh, that had glass and you could see, and I don't like that anymore. Um, I used to think it was really cool, but I don't think it's very cool now. 
because I see the risk I'm taking. It's right there. You can, you can see. And, and I don't know the guys who built it. I don't know the guys who take care of it on an ongoing basis. And so I don't want to see it. It's a lot easier to trust when we don't have to see. But we do it all the time. Get on an elevator every time you, you know, maybe go to a hotel or, or, you know, in a bigger, larger building or something like that. I, it, we put a lot of faith inside of those things. Unless you've ever been in an elevator that got stuck for hours and hours and maybe you just avoid them. You'd rather take the stairs now or whatever. But we just, we trust. Get in airplanes. And we trust. We have confidence in these things because we have developed a string of positive experiences usually that add up to confidence, that add up to trust. We're willing to take those, those steps and we don't even think about it most of the time. It's our, it's our experiences, both negative and positive, either way, that shapes how we feel and respond to those types of situations. When we talk about faith in Jesus, uh, the discussion be can become a bit confusing. This is, where it, this is where it gets weird. Because we don't understand what faith is sometimes and what the true focal point of faith is. I have heard so many times, I've uh, been, been speaking with someone who had an objection to faith in Jesus because it seemed too much like just a, this, this whole religion thing. You know, it's just this leap of faith. Use that term, leap of faith. As if, as if belief in Jesus is, is requiring some sort of leap out into the darkness. And that is completely the opposite of what Jesus invites us into. Faith in Jesus is not a leap into the darkness. It's also, not about, it's also not about quantity of belief or quantity of confidence. As if, you know, we, we say things like, I just need to have more faith, right? We want to put it in that. We even, and, and we even do this. We take, you know, Jesus, Jesus told a story about, um, about the kind of faith we need. And he said, if you have the faith of this mustard seed, right? He talked about the mustard seed faith. And we keep that story in our mind and in our heart as, okay, that is the measure. That's the quantity. And, and what we don't realize is that Jesus was saying it's actually not about quantity at all. Faith isn't about quantity. Like how much faith do you have? Rather, it's about the quality of the object of your faith. I remember uh, so many times um, being out on a hike and coming to a stream. You've, you've all been there. If you've gone on a hike, you come to a stream and you didn't really feel like getting your feet wet. And you wanted to cross on something. And so what we do is we look up this way and we look down this way. And sooner, somewhere, right, there's, there's a tree uh, or something laying across this uh, creek or stream or whatever. And we're going to, we're going to uh, cross over on that. And there have been a few times where I've gone and I have kind of wondered. You, you start off, you know, kind of getting on the 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 log or whatever, and you get your balance, and you kind of, yeah, I, I don't know if you do this. I do this. I always do this. I just kind of give it a little, just a little bounce up and down, right? Is this thing, is this thing stable? I don't want to find out that it's not when I'm halfway over, right? Nobody wants that. And so we kind of creep out there little by little, hoping, trusting, and placing confidence, whether we feel a great quantity of it or not, placing our confidence in that to hold us up. Faith is about not the quantity, but it's about, it's about the quality of the thing that we're putting our faith in. Our faith is not in, in people 
our faith is not in leaders. I, I certainly hope that, uh, that your faith, your, you know, here you are. I'm so glad you've, you've come today and, and are a part of what is happening here at Delta Christian. But listen, I'm telling you, your faith should not be placed in me. If, if, if that's what it is, it's misplaced faith. Because inevitably, though I, I don't want to, but inevitably, sooner or later, I'm going to fail you. And oftentimes, this is, this is what happens. You know, we go to, sometimes we go to church and we get hurt. Um, because maybe it's because of something somebody said or something somebody did or, you know, decisions that were made. Or, I mean, there's, there's, there's a million things that you can, you can get frustrated by or hurt by in a church because oftentimes what we do is we just sort of unwittingly put our confidence in people. And here's one thing I know for sure about people. We fail. We don't always measure up to the expectations that others have on us. So we don't, we, I rarely measure up to the expectations I put on myself. So our faith isn't in people. Our faith isn't in our leaders. It's not, at least it shouldn't be in our money. It shouldn't be in a political or military power. It's not in humanity. We just need to believe in ourselves more. Please. That's the last thing we need to do. Jesus alone is the object of our faith. We trust in the name of Jesus because there is power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. This is where our trust is. He's that, he's that bridge that we can go out and, and he, we, we trust that he can bear the weight of our sin and our life, that he can bear us unto eternity, into salvation, because he alone is able to do it. This is what our faith is all about. Listen, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, in, in verse 1, it gives us this uh, tremendous definition of what faith is. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And this is where, um, this is where we get a little bit, um, we can get a little bit confused about faith because we deal with the seen world most of the time. I mean, that's just kind of, that's just kind of how we live, right? We're trying to live in the real world. It's, it's physical stuff that we can touch and taste and see and smell. We have experiences that we, you know, where we're interacting with these things. And so um, when, it, when, we, when it comes to the things that are not so tangible to us, at least on an everyday, normal, physical world um, circumstance, that's where we begin to struggle a little bit with faith. And we begin, to, we begin to develop this separation, this divide between things that are spiritual and we'll even say this sometimes, and things that are real. You see how that could kind of start to develop a little bit of a problem? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. In other words, we take a stance because of faith, and we're talking specifically about faith in Christ, that even though we don't see, we still believe in, it, in its reality, in its truth. The essential nature of the things of Christ. A couple of verses later, the writer of Hebrews kind of brings this idea up in, in importance for us. He's, he makes this statement. He says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. That is to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That might be, um, you know, that might come across as being a little, uh, a little bit intimidating, <laughs> a little bit, um, a little bit scary, because uh, you know sometimes when we're uh, we're in that place, if you're here today and and maybe you're, um, maybe you are in that 
that, that phase of life or that place in life where you're seeking. You're just asking the questions. You're not sure about all of this. Do you, do you really believe in Jesus yet or not? And I want you to know that seeking after God, seeking after his truth, is an act of faith. Not this, not this leap into the darkness kind of faith that people talk about when, sometimes when they, when they talk about what Christianity is, if we don't understand. But seeking the truth, seeking answers, getting, um, getting honest about what is, and, and, and just asking the question, God, I don't know if you're there, but if you are. That might not feel like a large quantity of faith, but my friend, it is still faith, and it's the kind of faith that God rewards. If you seek God, that's the kind of faith that he rewards. That's the kind of faith that he's looking for in others. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's this... uh, kind of a recounting of a lot of history of, of those, sometimes it's called the hall of fame of faith and, and all of those um, all of those people in the Old Testament who trusted God and, and went, you know, we read about them from, um, from Abraham and, and Moses and Noah and the prophets and, and uh, all, of the, all of those who kind of have gone before us and we read about in the pages of scripture, it just goes through and talks about their faith faith, though they didn't see, though they were never rewarded with their hope in this world, they trusted, they had faith. And the very next chapter begins with these words, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, we're not alone. We're not running this race. We're not pursuing this faith all by ourselves. We are doing so shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm with all of the, uh, of the great men and women of faith who've gone before us. Therefore, what he's saying is, don't, we don't need to run timidly. We don't need to act like we don't have much to believe in. We can run this race with our whole heart. He says in verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In this, in this verse right here, he, he puts it all together for us. He's saying, listen, your, your faith in Christ, this, this trust, isn't an unfounded trust. Just like, you know, you're, you're just like you go out every morning and you start your car believing that it will start and you just do it. You just assume it. It's, it's not an unfounded thing for you to do because day after day after day you do this. You go through all of these things. You walk into the room and you flip the light switch and the lights just come on. You have trust in it because day after day after day you do this and it always happens. And faith in Jesus is not some kind of um, is not some kind of crazy leap into something silly and stupid and frivolous. But it's rather an expression of faith that's based on something. It has its foundation. As we talked about um, on, on Easter Sunday, it has its foundation in an event that happened that changed the world. When Jesus was, was crucified and buried in a tomb and then rose from the dead. He is the founder. See, it's in, his, it's in his death, burial, and resurrection that all this that we do, this is the foundation of all of it. And it's a strong foundation. It's a testable and tested foundation. A 
and you're even invited. Jesus invites you to check it out. Come and discover. Come and learn. Come with eyes open. Come asking questions. Take your best shot. You can, you can trust this foundation because you can test this foundation. And not only is he trustworthy because he, he endured the cross and he rose from the dead, but we can trust him today because we know that he is sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. In other words, not only does he have the proof in the resurrection that he can keep his promises or that he will, he will be faithful to keep his promises, but we can also know this, he has the power to keep his promises. Because after rising from the dead, he didn't just go back and lay down in the dust again. But he lives. It's in light of it's in, in light of all this that the apostle Paul writes these incredible words in Galatians chapter uh, two, where he says, he, "He says I have been crucified with Christ." This is an incredible statement of faith if you think about it. I have been crucified with Christ, he says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that Paul does not make a distinction between you know, your, your physical life and your spiritual life. He doesn't separate those two things out. He says, the life I live in the, in the flesh, I live by faith. The life, that, the life is, the, it's one thing. There aren't, these, there aren't these separate categories for us to live different parts of our lives in. The life I, I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This was, this was a reasonable faith for Paul, who, not that long before he wrote this, was hunting down Christians to persecute them, throw them in jail, have them beaten, and even killed. This is the reason for the faith that he has. I think one of the uh, greatest examples of faith, it's, it's kind of, it, it's a little bit easier for us. I think that we can admit that. It's a little bit easier for us because of the perspective that we have in human history. We sit, uh, you know, here in, in these years, all of this history that has gone on before us that we have received um, through, through not only the scriptures, but through countless other um, sources, uh, that we, that we have access to today. We, we kind of sit in this place that it's really easy for us to, to look back and even look back with, with judgment. Sometimes we, we talk about the ancient Israelites, you know, the, with, in the time of the judges and how, how faithless they were over and over and over again. And God would, um, God would punish them and then they would repent and then the God would raise them up again and then it was just like this, this cycle. And we sort of, we sort of talk about that and, and give them a a little bit of a hard time, and I think, I think it might be good for us to, to maybe lay off a little bit, because they didn't have the riches that we have. They didn't have the, the, all the scriptures that we have, and all of the, the, the evidence of all of the things that God has done over and over and over to prove his faithfulness to us. They certainly didn't have the atonement. They didn't have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to look upon they didn't have the promise of the, un, the indwelling Holy Spirit and the, the, the fullness of the word that we have. And so it's kind of amazing when we look back in time at men like Abraham who didn't have any of that and yet what he had was just simply a call upon his life to follow God. 
The Apostle Paul outlines this in, in the book of Romans in chapter 4. Starting in verse 18, he says this, In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. I love that phrase that Paul uses that. He was, a, he was an old fella. <laughs> That's kind of mean. I guess you can, you know, we can't, should we, like, was it too soon? I don't know. Um, it had been a while. I think probably nerves were okay, but it just seems like a funny thing to say. He was, a, he was about 100 years old when all of this was happening. And he and goes on to say, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. He's talking about this, this couple that has never had a child together, and they are old. They are so old. And when I say that, don't feel, these, they were 100 years old. This is, you, you know, when was the last time you got, like, one, a little card, congratulations on your new baby, for a, for a couple that was living in a nursing home, right? You probably haven't ever had to do that, right? This is, this is what he's talking about. God had promised them that they would have a child. And here they are in their hundreds They didn't stop believing. They had confidence that God could, all by himself, bear the weight of the promise that he made to them. Verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in the faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Notice where his faith is. It is in God. Abraham learned to trust in God. We can go back and read his story. We don't have time to do it this morning, but go back and read his story and see how um, over, the, you know, over a period of a lot of time, Abraham learned to really and truly trust in God. At the very beginning, God came to Abraham and told him to go to a place. I want you to pack up your stuff, and I want you to go to this place I'm going to show you. And Abraham's like, okay, God, I trust you. I'm going to do it. And he packed his stuff up, and he moved a few miles up the river. And stayed. And then God came to me again. Nope. I, I want you to follow me. I want you to trust me. And, and go to this place. I will show you. And the next time he obeyed and went to that place. And God said, I'm going to take care of you. And, and over and over again, Abraham would get nervous. And he would go to another place. And, uh, you know, th there would be... There would be a famine, it would drive him somewhere else, and he would go to where there was food, and he, would, he was afraid that something would happen because his wife, his wife, Sarah, must have been really, really beautiful because everywhere he went, he was afraid that people were going to kill him because she was so beautiful. So she, he told her to tell everybody that, you know, it's, it's my sister, which is really weird. Um, to, uh, to at least to our ears, right, and our sensitivities and, and all that. But over time, he learned to, to not be so afraid and to trust in God. And, and there was a time that he and, he and his wife even took, you know, this promise into their own hands. And, and his wife gave him a, a, another, uh, another wife to have a baby with. And God says, no, that's, that's not what I'm doing here. I don't need your help to keep my promises. And in his hundreds... He and Sarah became pregnant. But they had learned from experience. Not in blindness, but with decades and decades of real world experience where God kept his promises over and over and over and over and over again. They learned to trust in him. Verse 22, that is why his faith was 
counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In other words, I want you to hear this. God is willing to take whatever trust you've got and walk with you and prove to you over and over and over and over and over again in your life how trustworthy he is. This is what Paul calls us to and when, he's, when he says these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And this faith, these things to pursue with our whole heart. These things, this is what God was really looking for for us. Those who are pursuing this relationship of trust. Can God be trusted? God is like, I love it when people ask me that question. God does not get offended when you ask him that question. Sometimes we might. Like if somebody looked at you, can I really trust you? You might find that offensive. You might find that, you know, somebody questioning your character or whatever. But I'm, let me tell you, God doesn't do that. God is not offended when you ask him that question. God embraces that moment. And I believe says, let me show you. As I wrap up this morning, I have, I have a couple, I want to say a couple of things here. First of all, uh, if you're here today and, and you, are, you are in the process of considering Jesus, if that's you. Maybe you're watching online today and, and um, you're, you're, you're considering Jesus. Here, here's what I would say. Here's my challenge to you. Investigate. Go for it. Search. Evaluate, reason, and observe. Consider what evidence there is that would be a reason to trust in the promises and in the faithfulness and in the power of Jesus. God will never reject your honest pursuit of truth. He will, in fact, reward your search and demonstrate his faithfulness in your life. He will do it. Listen, just, just listen to this reasoning. If he exists, then he will do it. If he doesn't exist, he can't do it. So when he does it, and I mean when he does it, you will know that he is God. Investigate. Give it your best shot. God will show up. He will reward your search. Number two, for those of you who um, have placed your faith in Jesus, and I know in this room that is going to be the majority of you. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, then here's my, here's my encouragement to you today. In an endeavor to reinforce and cultivate and strengthen and illuminate and inform your faith in Jesus through a careful study of his promises. Listen, if we don't know what his promises are, how can we ever know when he keeps them? We need to be in his word and we need to study those promises and his faithfulness and, and understand the nature of his power. I would encourage you and challenge you, determine never to confuse the object of your faith, that is Jesus, with the existence of faith itself. Only trust in Jesus, not in faith. Don't have faith in faith. I think sometimes that's what we do. Sometimes we're just like, I have faith in faith. What does that even mean? It's faith in Jesus. Not faith in faith. Not faith in intellect. Not faith in good deeds. Not faith in religions or creeds or money or genealogy or anything else. 
always pursue the refinement of a more sincere faith in Jesus by seeking him more and more for the rest of your days, walking with him, learning all you can of him, moving toward him. If we really want to embrace a sincere faith, which is the kind of faith, you can't, you, listen, you can't, Pull the wool over God's eyes. He understands the difference between sincere faith and insincere faith. And let me just throw this out here for a second, okay? Insincere faith asks this question. How far can I get from Jesus and still be saved? If you're asking that question, you need to check yourself. Sincere faith asks, how close can I possibly get to Jesus in my lifetime? For all of you, whatever you do, don't give up. Never give up this pursuit of faith. There is nothing, listen, there is just nothing more pointless than, than giving up. Um, his love will never, ever fail you. It will never, ever run out. It will never, ever fail. So never, ever give up. Faith can become for us an elusive or ethereal, spiritualistic concept, one that becomes very difficult for us to grasp. We, we make it a function of our emotions, our feelings, or we, or, or we give it a category all of its own, separate from the rest of our real or everyday life. We tend to think of faith in terms of quantity, that person has a lot of faith or not enough faith or, or whatever, instead of focusing on the quality of the object of our faith. When we allow these circumstances to exist within our understanding of faith, we often will go to one of these two extremes. Either we will work hard to develop more faith, stronger faith, tougher faith, more stubborn faith. It's like being some kind of muscle-bound gold gym version of, of faith. In faith. And it's really... It, it's, it's meaningless. Sometimes I wonder, Jesus, I think about Jesus looking down at us, just trying to build bigger faith. And he's like, you don't understand that it's not about how big your faith is in God. It's about how big the God your faith is in. Our faith is in his greatness. Or, on the other hand, we spiritualize faith altogether, just relegating it to the, the realm of the transcendent, spiritual, metaphorical, uh, <laughs> mystical, mysterious place that has absolutely no contact with our day-to-day -day reality. And somehow, inside of that picture, we soothe ourselves with the celebration of it as a, 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 you know, just God's mystery in our life, but we gain little to no actual growth and help from it because it has nothing to do with life. It requires an emptying of the mind in that circumstance to find peace. And this is exactly what, I mean, so, so much of the world is saying. The, the world defines meditation as getting quiet and emptying your mind. That is the exact opposite of how God tells you to meditate. When we meditate on his scripture, we fill our mind with his voice. His word. God doesn't invite you into an emptying of your mind. That is, that is not what Christianity is. He wants you to be filled. 
What we really desire is a faith that is rooted in reality, that offers answers for life's toughest questions, that inspires us to embrace the intrinsic beauty and value of being made in God's image, and that offers redemption from our own brokenness and defects and faults. Friends, God doesn't offer you an escape from the real, no intoxication to numb the pain of brokenness of being human, no silly pat answers to life's most important or difficult questions. What God does offer is the power of the truth about everything, about the universe, about humanity, about how, about you. And how all of this stuff works and how his work and plan intersects your life to redeem you into the life that you were created to live. This is the world that he has invited you to come into and learn to see. You can't see it by putting on a blindfold. But you can see it by taking one off. Faith in God is not a leap into the darkness. It is rather a leap into the light of truth and reality. And if you'll pursue it, he will show you. He will reveal it to you. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, I thank you that you are a God of reality, a God of truth. Your word, is, uh, your word is full of truth. Sometimes it's the, it's the not too pleasant truth. Sometimes it's an embarrassing truth, but it always is the truth. You're a God who tells it like it is and, and invites us to come and have our eyes open to the world, to reality as it is. And Father, we admit that there are some, sometimes that reality scares us. Sometimes, God, we'd rather see something else. But our faith is not in this, this creation. It's not in this world. It's not in our own strength. It's not in our own uh, intelligence. It's not in any of these things. Father, you have called us to place our faith in you, and that is exactly what we endeavor to do. God, would you teach us how to trust you more by showing us each and every day the truth of your faithfulness? Even when we're unfaithful, you're faithful. God, we realize this, that you are above all things worthy, worthy of our trust, worthy of all our confidence. And a life lived in pursuit of this faith is a life lived well. Help us to be your people of faith. In Jesus' name we pray.